The Peter Schiff Show. Well, it's April Fool's Day today, and there certainly were a lot of fools out on Wall Street buying all the nonsense about the better-than-expected non-farm payroll numbers, which I will get to a little later in the podcast. In fact, many of those fools were also fooled into thinking that these supposedly good jobs numbers puts a June rate hike back on the table. In fact, these April Fools were out in force in March when several Fed officials were talking about the possibility of April being a live meeting, and these fools bought it, and Janet Yellen potentially set them straight a few days ago, but then again, they hear some numbers that they think are better than expected, and they think, aha, this means the Fed is about to raise rates. When are these fools going to wake up and realize that none of these numbers matter? It doesn't even matter what they are, better than expected, worse than expected, The Fed can't raise rates. If the Fed could raise rates, they would have already done it. Yes, they did raise rates in December. They didn't want to raise rates in December. They did it anyway. And look what happened. I mean, maybe you can think of that rate hike as a trial balloon, right? But it was the Hindenburg of trial balloons. It blew up and there's no way the Fed wants to launch another one. You know, the first quarter came to an end yesterday. And the U.S. stock market actually managed to gain. It was up, you know, maybe about 1%, the S&P, the Dow. But the year started off as the worst year in the history of the stock market. Right back in February, U.S. stocks were at the weakest beginning of a year in the history of the stock market. I mean, going all the way through the Great Depression, that's how bad it was. That happened because the Fed raised rates. You think they want to do it again? You think they want to take that chance? Why did the market recover? Because people then believed that the Fed wasn't going to be raising rates. In fact, the weakness in the market is one of the reasons that they believe that. So the market going down is what theoretically helped cause the Fed to change its tune, enabling the market to go back up. Now, they're not going to want to take another chance that they're going to save it again. I mean, what if next time it goes down and keeps on falling? I mean, they're very lucky that the market managed to recover so that by the time people got their statements for the first quarter, they're barely changed. A lot of people probably have no idea the kind of bullets that they dodge. People, maybe people didn't look at their account statements in, in February. They don't know what happened. But the reality is, forget about these superficial returns. Beneath the surface, there was a lot of carnage in the market. The first quarter was a bloodbath because there are a lot of stocks that really got taken out and shot. A lot of high profile stocks got blown up and some big hedge funds had horrible, horrible results in the first quarter. I mean, the hedge funds were on the wrong side of so many macro trades this quarter. For example, the U.S. dollar had its worst quarter in over five years. Now, you remember, that was one of the most crowded trades out there. At the end of last year, everybody with a hedge fund was long the dollar and short the euro, short the yen, short the Aussie, short the Canadian. You name it, they were short. Some of these guys were short the Chinese yuan. Yuan had a pretty good quarter, too. It was almost its strongest quarter in two years. So everybody who was long the dollar and short another currency got killed in the first quarter. The only people that lost more money than the people shorting the dollar were the people who were shorting gold. Because gold had its best quarter in better than 30 years. Gold was up more than 16% in the first quarter. Imagine being short that, especially with the amount of leverage that these guys have. And, you know, this was the first time ever that hedge funds were net short. They ended last year net short. See, normally what would be a small position would be to have the hedge funds to have a, a record low long position, right? That not that many hedge funds were long gold. Instead, not only were they not long, they were actually short. They were betting that the price of gold would go down. Well, instead it went up. And of course, even though the market recovered, right? We had the big swan, right? A big dive early in the quarter and then a recovery. A lot of people sold out during that dive. So they don't own the stocks. They didn't come, they weren't, they didn't ride it back up, right? Because when the market was down 10%, And people were worried that it might go down 20%. A lot of people bailed out. So a lot of people took these losses in January, February. And so they didn't get the March rebound. So even though the market itself recovered, a lot of investors did not recover 
because they, they sold out. Now, of course, if you were invested internationally, you had a great quarter. This is probably the best quarter since any quarter that I can remember since 2009 to have been invested internationally because the weakness in the dollar was a big tailwind. I think emerging markets had their best quarter in four years. So those stocks were very strong, but also stocks related to commodities. Oil stocks had a great quarter. Oil surge, you know, a lot of hedge funds were short oil. Oil stocks went way up. Gold stocks had a spectacular quarter, spectacular quarter. I mean, and you know, maybe they had quarters this good in 2009, maybe. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe not. This is one of the best quarters I can remember for gold stocks. Now, no one on Wall Street owns gold stocks, but, you know, people like me own them. Our clients own gold stocks. Uh, and so they had a great quarter. So if you were investing abroad, if you were investing in resources, if you were investing in gold, you had a phenomenal quarter. And... For my opinion, this is the beginning of a new trend. I think the years of outperformance, the dollar bubble has burst. And I think this is the biggest dollar bubble I've ever seen. And I think there's more air that's going to come out of it. You know, the last dollar bubble popped in 2001, and that one had inflated along with the dot-com bubble. The dollar index got up to about 120 in that bubble. And by the time it was it bottomed out in 2008, the dollar index was almost 70. Ironically, ironically, it was the financial crisis that saved the dollar. It's not going to get that lucky again. We're not going to get another financial crisis. We're going to get a dollar crisis. The dollar route's going to turn into a dollar crisis this time. I think this time it's going to be worse than the 1970s. The dollar index didn't get all the way back up to 120, right? It got up to about 100. And now it's down around 94 and a half. And I think it could make its way down to the low 80s before the end of this year and then take out the, the 70 handle by the end of next year and then start to free fall and go a lot lower. The worst period of time in history for the U.S. dollar was the 1970s. You know, that's when when Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. Uh, the dollar declined until Ronald Reagan came in, and it was a huge decline. I think this one that we're just beginning, I think this new bear market or this new leg in this ongoing secular bear market that started in 1971, right, when we went off the gold standard, I think this is going to be the biggest leg down yet. And it may be the final leg. It may be the one that totally destroys the whole dollar system. But I think this is just beginning, and I think the returns that were experienced internationally in the first quarter, that is not an aberration. We're not going to go back to the U.S. doing well. We're, you know, the, the U.S. is going to be lucky if it can tread water like it did in the first quarter, but it's really not treading water. It's really drowning. If you measure U.S. stocks in any other currency, the Dow had a bad quarter. I mean, if you measure the Dow in gold, it had a horrible quarter because if gold was up 16%, and the Dow was up 1%, that means the Dow was down 15% for the quarter if you want to price it in real money, and it's only going to get worse from there. But I want to spend some more time on the jobs numbers that, again, fooled all the April fools today, believing the government spin that this is good news. Now, why do people think that the jobs news is good? Well, because we put up another 200,000 plus number, right? The consensus was for 210,000 jobs and we created 215,000. Also, there were no big down revisions to last month. In fact, they notched it up from 242 to 245. Now, I think the prior month they took a few thousand off. So I think the revisions subtracted two or 3,000 jobs over the past three months. So very little in the way of downward revisions. But we got 215,000 jobs for the month. And hey, this is supposed to be great. Now, maybe there were people that were thinking, well, maybe we'll get a bad report. You know, I'm always thinking that eventually we're going to get a bad report because the lucky streak has got to end, right? There's only so many part-time jobs we can create. At some point, we're going to get a bad number. And I think when we do, the dollar is going to get crushed and gold is going to take off. But I guess the people who are waiting for that bad number, the minute they see one that isn't bad, there is a knee-jerk reaction, buy the dollar, sell gold. And that is exactly what happened. I mean, gold sold off sharply. It was down at one point, maybe 20 bucks. Only closed off about seven, though. It did rally back. And the dollar spiked up on this number. But by the end of the day, the dollar index ended up negative, And most currencies ended up positive against the dollar, despite that knee-jerk reaction to the supposedly better than expected number. But as always is the case, the devil is in the details. And I will get into the details now. First of all, 
One of them is not really a detail. The official unemployment rate actually ticked up to 5%, right? Last month it was 4.9, now it's 5, which is interesting because I don't know why people think that this report means that Janet Yellen is now more likely to want to raise rates. If they wouldn't raise rates when the unemployment rate was 4.9%, why on earth would they want to raise them when it's 5%? It's going the other direction. So you would think any increase in the unemployment rate would mean the Fed was less likely to raise rates, not more. But let's skip that obvious point. And we'll go to the labor force participation rate, which did notch up to 63% from 62.9, which may be one of the reasons that the unemployment rate went up because a few more people entered the labor market, couldn't find jobs, and so now they're officially unemployed before they didn't count because they weren't in the labor market. One of the things that Wall Street thought was exciting was the fact that wages were up 0.3 and they were supposed to be up 0.2, so that was a beat. But remember, last month, wages dropped 0.1. So overall... It's still pretty uh, minimal wage growth. And hours worked, which were supposed to recover slightly from last week's decline, didn't recover at all. They stayed, you know, they were looking for 34.5 hours worked. Instead, it remained at the 34.4 level. So there was no recovery. But here are the real details. Again, it's part time versus full time employment, which is the biggest story. So, According to the household survey, 127,000 jobs that were created of the 215,000 in March, 127,000 went to people who already had at least one job. Maybe they had two, but they at least had one because the number of people with multiple jobs in the month of March went up by 127,000. So that means at a minimum, at least 127,000 of those jobs were part-time jobs, because if you already have a job, you can't have a full-time job. You can only have a part-time job. So 60% of these jobs went to people who already had jobs. So we know those are part-time. But of course, more of the jobs are part-time because some people got their first part-time job. So they wouldn't count as a multiple job holder. In order to be a multiple job holder, you would have had to have at least one part-time job going into March, and now you picked up a second one or a third one. So that's really what's going on. So I would guess, again, if 60% of these jobs went to people who already had part-time jobs, probably at least another 20% were part-time jobs going to people who had no jobs and got their first part-time job. In fact, if you actually look at the numbers, the unemployment rate for full-time workers went up uh, from 4.9 to 5.1, and the unemployment rate for part-time workers went down from 4.9 to 4.8. They actually break that down, but they don't tell you the exact number, but you can kind of back into it to realize that this is all about part-time jobs. In fact, if you look at manufacturing and the number of manufacturing jobs that were lost, it was the biggest drop in manufacturing workers since 2009. Much bigger loss. They, I think they were only looking for something like 2,000 job loss in manufacturing, and we lost 29,000 jobs. And those, those are our best paying jobs. At the same time, the number of waiters and waitresses surged to an all-time record high. And this is what's going on. See, let's say you're a waiter and your employer will not let you work full-time, right? You work part-time. He's not going to let you work full-time because he can't afford the benefits. He can't afford the Obamacare. So you're a waiter and you got a part-time job. What do you do? You find another restaurant and you get a second part-time job. That's why we created 215,000 jobs because a lot of waiters and bartenders who had one gig got a second gig or a third gig. I mean, why else do you think we'd have record numbers of people working? Because we're counting so many people multiple times. So this was not a good report. This is another month where people got jobs in healthcare and education, retail trade, leisure and hospitality, low paying, part time uh, uh, jobs, service sector jobs, basically information technology jobs, 1,000 added. We lost 2,500 jobs in transportation and warehousing. We lost 12,000 jobs in mining and logging. Those are some good paying jobs. We lost, again, 29,000 jobs in, um, in manufacturing. So we, we added the jobs we don't want, and we lost the jobs we do want. That is the real story. It's the story that nobody wants to tell. Everybody wants to, uh, to talk about the number 
as if this is some kind of economic miracle that we keep creating these jobs. Look, the reason that Bernie Sanders keeps kicking Hillary Clinton's butt in so many of these states, you know, the states that are not majority minority in the Democratic Party, the reason he's doing that is because the economy is lousy and the people voting for Bernie Sanders know it's lousy. That's why they don't want to vote for Clinton. Because if it was good, they'd vote for Clinton because Clinton is associated with Obama. And if you think the Obama economy is good, you want four more years. So you want to vote for Hillary. If you think this is a rotten economy and you want something different, you're going to vote for Sanders. And that's what's going on. And I think if a lot of the people in the Mari community, if they actually, you know, thought more about the issues, they'd probably vote Sanders, too. But they're not. They're just, for some reason, blindly following the leadership. And the leadership is in bed with Hillary for who knows what reason. Uh, and uh, and so that's what they're doing. And the same thing on the Republican side, again, for Trump. I mean, these these Republicans who are upset, but they, they know that things were bad even, even before Obama. They're fed up with the country. They're fed up with the Republican Party. And so they're giving it the middle finger by supporting Donald Trump. Now, we got some more economic news that came out during the day. Some of the bad news was the construction spending number for February, which was down 0.5. They were looking for a slight gain of 0.2. Now, they did have a slight upward revision to the prior month, January. Uh, But overall, I'd say that the number was disappointing also because of the trend. And but I think the most disturbing number that came out today on the negative side, we did get some numbers that beat like the ISM manufacturing index, that actually was 49.5%, 49.5 in February. And it was supposed to go back up above 50 to 50.5. Instead, it spiked up to 51.8. So that actually was a, a bit above estimates, but I'm not going to read too much into that. The PMI manufacturing index came in slightly below at 51.5. The consensus was 51.7, but it's a little bit above the 51.3 from February, but still it's a weak number. But the one that should really get people nervous were the motor vehicle sales, because that number came out a lot lower. The consensus for total vehicle sales. Now, this is American automobile companies. It would it would include the cars they're selling internationally, right? The total sales from the American uh, auto companies, the estimate was 17.6 million. The actual was 16.6 million. It was a full million dollars short. But the domestic is where it really got clobbered. I'm not even sure what the consensus was for domestic, actually. But last month, domestic auto sales were 14.1 million in February. In March, it went all the way down to 9.7 million. That is a huge decline in domestic sales. And inventories to sales are exploding in the auto sector. And I've been talking a lot about the auto bubble, the subprime lending bubble. That's one of the things that's been driving this so-called recovery has been all the people who have been buying cars. But of course, they've been buying cars on government credit. They've been buying cars that they can't afford and they shouldn't have bought in the first place. And a lot of the sales uh, have been, you know, basically front loaded because the government bailed out all the auto companies, right? Obama bailed out GM. They bailed out uh, Ford or Chrysler, and they, they want to claim they saved the auto industry. So they want to make sure that these companies are selling cars. Even if the people buying them can't really afford them, they want to make sure that they drive revenue so they can pretend that they did a good thing by bailing these companies out. But they've just set them up for a bigger collapse. I think the next time the auto sector collapses, it's going to be even bigger and the losses are going to be even bigger. And the question is, is the next administration going to bail out Detroit the same way the Obama administration did, because by bailing them out, we basically solidified all the problems that made them fail in the first place. And now they're going to fail again, only in a more spectacular way, because the government prevented the free market from sorting everything out. We just bailed everything out. But of course, temporarily, yes, yeah, you can take credit for saving all these jobs. But the reality is we would have better jobs and more jobs if we had a vibrant automobile sector that was allowed to restructure in the market instead of propping up the inefficient, bloated uh, U.S. companies that didn't work and ran themselves into bankruptcy. And now we basically bailed that out instead of letting the creative destruction of capitalism work. uh, Instead, we replaced it 
with the pure destruction of socialism. Also, I noticed, too, the Baker Hughes rig count, which we get every week, collapsed again. In fact, U.S. rigs went from 464 down to 450. Uh, and the whole North American count went from 519 to 499. I think that's better than a 40-year low in the rig count. And that continues to fall. And so that means, obviously, employment right in that energy sector is going to continue to fall because the rigs aren't there. But I think it does mean that as the price of oil turns around, which I think it already has, and I think a weaker dollar is simply going to fuel that increase, I think U.S. drillers are going to be very reluctant uh, to try to bring these rigs back on stream. I think it's going to be a while before the capacity catches up to the price. And so for a while, we were talking about energy surpluses, right? Oh, there's a glut. There's a glut. Well, as soon as the dollar collapses, that glut's going to turn into a shortage because demand for oil and internationally is going to take off, yet we're not going to have the domestic capacity. And of course, a lot of these companies got into a lot of trouble. They had a lot of debt. Many of them are broke. And the banks are not going to line up to lend out new money just because the price of oil has come back up. A lot of them might not expect it to stay up. They might think, well, yes, oil came back up to 50 or $60 a barrel, but we're not going to lend you any money to go drill because what if it goes right back down to 30 So I think that put the, you know, a scare into a lot of the lenders, and it's not like they have that much uh, to lend, uh, but I think that this is going to be very destructive. And ultimately, you remember, people were thinking, oh, all we need is higher oil prices, and that's going to be good for the stock market. It's not going to be good for the stock market. It'll be good for oil stocks, but it's not going to be good for the overall economy if the price of oil goes up. Because one of the main crutches that the underemployed, underpaid American consumer is leaning on is cheap gas. Take that away. He's got nothing left. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.